Okay, case three. This was a, oh, what was the history? It was, it was a 70 year old woman with a skin colored nodule in the back. Clinically, they wanted sebaceous cyst. You know what I say, if you've watched any of my stuff online, you know, it's like one of my pet peeves. It's always a cyst or a lipoma until it's not. So, um, you know, the, I can't tell you how many rare cancer patients with dermatophyte fibrous sarcoma protuberans and other diseases that were clinically misdiagnosed as cyst. Because any nodule that's down in the deep dermis or subcutis is going to look like a skin color bump and cysts and lipomas are common. So it's understandable, but this is why uh, it's important to consider biopsying lesions. Okay, so who takes this one? I'll take this one. So this looks like a well circumscribed, uh, relatively well circumscribed lesion uh, yep. in the deep dermis. Um, so um, in terms of architecture, um, if, you, if you can go... Uh, where the cells tend to have some sort of testicular pattern. Um, they're running yeah, in these bundles. Um, yeah. Uh, the cells have bland, um, uh, the cells are bland, they have brown nuclei, um, and um, some vesicular chromatin. Yeah, I try to move. Sorry. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of vascular spaces. Yep, true. It can sometimes be hard to tell, and especially on a on a scan. But yeah, I feel like right here, see, there's an endothelial cell, and it's making a lumen, and then around here, there's a pericyte, which is that little muscle cell that wraps, and then the tumor cells are out. So even though the nuclei do look pretty similar, I feel like these are probably discrete little vessels in the background. But admittedly, that can actually be really challenging, um, especially tumors that are hypervascular. I find that a lot of times pathologists have a tendency to want to think that the tumor is making vessels when it's actually just a background vascular network. Um, and I have to admit, though, that, that learning the vascular patterns and features of soft tissue tumors was really one of the later things that I learned. And, and I still was still some struggling to acquire it towards the end of my fellowship and into practice. So it's something a lot of times people talk about, oh, there's these dilated vessels or this kind of vessel or that. For my mind, I found that actually kind of hard sometimes early on, especially in my training, even in fellowship, to pick up on um, the different vascular patterns and, and what their significant what significance was. And that was something that it didn't really come until I was well into practice really and had seen a lot of tumors. So um, there's an area I wanted to show you here. I remember there was also one area with a lot of multinuclear. Yeah, there we go. Giant cells. They almost look kind of like Teuton giant cells, don't they? They've got like a little ring of nuclei, looks like a little bubbly at the edge and kind of smooth and pink in the middle. I, I, because this is a really interesting case, I put in a few extra slides, but I think really this slide is the, the best one. So I won't show the others, but anyone watching this online, I'll put links to the, the digital slides and you can really see, see all of them. This is a really difficult case. So if you couldn't figure it out, don't feel bad because I actually struggled to figure uh, this one out myself. Uh, because I had, I've only seen actually two of this entity in my life, in my whole career, including fellowship. And I saw both of these tumors. They were sent to me as consults from the same uh, pathologist, both from different patients. And they were sent to me like a month apart. I kind of felt like I was going crazy because I thought they're going to not believe me that I'm making a really rare diagnosis on two of their patients like a month apart. And then I've never seen another one since. But I'm always on the lookout, and I uh, I think the first I think this one came in second, and I recognized it right away, or, or very quickly. But the the first one I actually did a fair number of immunostains trying to figure out what it was until I, the idea occurred to me, and I did the right stain. Xanthogranuloma is a good idea, right? It looks like Teuton giant cells, and we've got lymphocytes and kind of fibrohistiocytic looking background. I mean, it's really hard to look at these cells. I mean, there's a ton of lymphocytes here, but otherwise, like, what are these spindled cells? Are they fibroblasts? Are they histiocytes? They kind of, that's why fibrohistiocytic you can kind of think of because they kind of are something in that zone between fibroblast and histiocyte. They don't really fit perfectly into any one cell type, right? Let me show you a stain that I did. Let's see what you think. I'm not going to tell you the stain. I'll let you tell me what the stain is. Does anyone recognize this stain? 
it's still coming into focus. And if not, I'll show you a closer high power picture of a really, to really clarify it. Looks like a bug stain. Ah, which one? AFD. Yes. That's the close up picture there. Look at those giant cells. They're fake Teuton giant cells. So in, and in fact, I'll get a shout out to two of my online friends, um, uh, Sanjay Mukhopadhyay and uh, Marcella Saib Lima, who are both uh, great, amazing people to follow on Twitter. They, through a conversation, came up with the idea that sometimes Cryptococcus makes these kind of pseudo Teuton giant cells that it's crypto organism around the outside instead of foam, like a real Teuton cell. So they, we kind of jokingly call those crouton cells because it's like crypto, uh, crypto and Teuton. It's like a portmanteau of those two words, which is, I thought, super fun. And I actually put that in my Dermpath Survival Guidebook and I cited the tweet thread and that's how it's done. So now it's embedded into the real the real literature, I suppose. Maybe not PubMed, but it's in a book. So in any case, I feel like this is the exact same phenomenon, only instead of crypto, it's happening with these acid fast bacilli. And you know what's really cool? These were so numerous that they were actually even positive on PAS stain. So I've seen this a couple of times when, when there were tons and tons of mycobacteria, they'll actually stain with PAS. No problem to tell these are not fungi. They're a little tiny thread-like thing, right? Fungus, I think I took these pictures on like 60X high dry objective. So really hard to get good pictures. Um, so on a scan, it still doesn't show up really well, but uh, don't be uh, confused by that, that sometimes PAS can stain AFB and also other bacteria occasionally as well. Um, but definitely these don't look morphologically like fun fungi. So um, this is like the most dramatic uh, example. And here, this is the scan. Look at how much. So not every cell, but especially these foamy cells, just loaded and loaded, not with foam, not with not with uh, lipid, but actually with mycobacteria. So then what would you call this thing? I mean, why, it's making a mass. It looks like a, a tumor, right? So this is, is a mycobacterial spindle cell pseudotumor. Sometimes mycobacterial infections produce a really exuberant, a fibroblastic and histiocytic and inflammatory response that makes a, a kind of inflammatory pseudotumor. The one other thing you could think of looking at this is inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which in the olden days was often called inflammatory pseudotumor, but now we recognize that there's kind of a group of things that can look inflammatory and pseudotumoral, and not all of those are true um, IMTs, which often express ALK1. So if you were thinking about that, you could try ALK1 here. Um, but yeah, sometimes mycobacteria make a pseudotumoral response, and this is a, just a dramatic example. They often are in immunosuppressed patients, and they're often multifocal. Uh, to my recollection, this patient didn't have any known immunosuppression. It was just one nodule, but I never did get follow-up, and I don't, I don't believe I ever found out what organism this was, uh, what this ended up being, but I would say that this is probably an atypical non-tuberculosis, non-leprosy form of mycobacteria, just mainly because the you, when I see older people with mycobacteria in the skin, sometimes it's leprosy, like in the South where I used to live in Arkansas, we would occasionally see leprosy in the skin. But otherwise, when I saw um, uh, acid fast bacilli in the skin of older people, they usually ended up being um, atypical of AFB. So, I mean, you still don't know without culturing or molecular to be sure. But this is a really dramatic example. The other case I saw of this did not have these beautiful cells loaded with organism, and but had this background of lymphocytes and fibrohistiocytic stuff and a little bit of granulomas. And that was the one I really struggled. I must've done like 10 immunostains thinking it was gonna be some spindle cell tumor. And then I saw the granulomas and I saw some plasma cells and I thought, maybe I should do bug stains and it was fight positive and I couldn't believe it. So the other thing, leprosy can do this too. And when leprosy makes a pseudotumor, it's called histoid leprosy. It's a form of lepromatous uh, multivacillary leprosy. And I've got a really beautiful example of a digital slide of that on Kiko, uh, the only example I think that I've seen in my practice. So if you want to see that, I'll add a video link down below. Let me add that to my, um, my to-do list for editing here. All right, histoid leprosy, I'll put a link. Okay, guys, so that is a really challenging case. I did not expect anyone to figure it out, but you've seen something now that's incredibly ultra rare, and that's the AFB, and this was the uh, this was the PAS. Just loads of organisms. Unreal, huh? Unbelievable. I think sometimes older people get these because as people get old, they tend to get some natural immunoparesis or d diminishment of their immune system. And I've seen this with mycobacteria a lot where people have loads of organisms when they're old and they don't have any other form of immunosuppression. Um, I feel like it's probably worthwhile to work those patients up for like chronic lymphocytic leukemia because that's a common 
finding in older people and it can give people immunosuppression. I've seen people with really aggressive, you know, squamous cell carcinomas and other things that showed up and then it turns out the patient had CLL that wasn't diagnosed yet. So I think it's not a bad idea to work them up for under underlying immunosuppression when you see something like this. Okay, close these out. Um, I had a question. So on the last slide of the um, of the third case, I think that's slide okay. four, number five. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So are are these fast? I mean, the presence of these vascular spaces yeah. is part of this pseudotumor. I don't know if these are actually vascular spaces. I don't know. I think probably what this is is a little little circular area as a fat necrosis. See, if you look around the edge, I think that that is a giant cell that's squished. And sometimes you can get little cystic pockets in fat necrosis, like for example, in post-traumatic fat necrosis or in lipodermatous sclerosis, which I was going to show at Grand Rounds, but I ran out of time because I talked too much. Um, but sometimes that can happen. You can get little circular spaces of fat necrosis. And I think around the edge here, those are histiocytes and giant cells. See like that? Look at that multinucleation. It's squished. So it's hard and it kind of looks like an endothelial cell, but endothelial cells shouldn't be multinucleated like that. So if I were going to, um, you know, you could do stain an endothelial marker, like an ERG and a CD68. Do be careful, C CD31 stains histiocytes oftentimes. It's usually weak granular staining. I've got a little video that shows some examples of that, but that can occasionally, I've seen people occasionally send things in thinking they're angiosarcoma when they're actually a histiocytic infiltrate. Um, because there is kind of a foamy, bubbly version of angiosarc, it's terrifying, very treacherous. Um, but in any case, 31 is, uh, is, is sometimes will stain, but it won't stain as strong as the vessels. So again, if you want to see, go watch that video and I, I show back to back so you can see. Um, no vascular stains perfect. CD34 is lost in some angiosarcomas, tends to be weaker or I'm sorry, it, yes, it lost completely in some angiosarcs. And it also stains lots of other stuff in the fiber, uh, fibroblastic and neural things, okay? CD31 is a really sensitive marker and pretty specific, but it also stains histiocytes. So in tumors where there's a lot of histiocytes in the background, that can be a problem. And then ERG is a really, in my hands, very, very sensitive. I, I have never, knocking on wood here, seen a, an ERG negative vascular lesion of any sort. I'm sure I will eventually, but if it's if ERG is negative or only patchy or focal positive and it's kind of weak, that is a strong, strong, strong argument against the vascular tumor of any kind in my experience. Now, that said, though, ERG is not specific. It stains lots of other stuff. It stains prostate cancer. It stains about half of epithelioid sarcomas, and it can stain a variety of other things, too. So, um, you know, none of them are perfect markers, but uh, in hard cases, I can use them in combination. But yeah, I think these are little bubbles, pockets of fat. Because look at that. See a giant cell there? I think that's what that is. Good question, though. And I think this is just cystic breakdown in the middle. I'm not sure if it actually is true in vivo, like what it was in the patient, or if it's a zone of fat necrosis, or if it kind of fell apart during processing in the lab. I, I can't really tell. There's no like real blood in here. So it may just be that this central part kind of fell apart during processing in the laboratory. That's quite possible. Great question though. And I like it. You brought up about the idea of angiomatoid FH. I definitely think from low power, that's a great idea. I mean, there's not a, usually those have a pretty dense cuff of lymphocytes and plasma cells, but not always. There are, uh, Steve Billings has written a really great paper about unusual variants of angiomatoid FH. I think with uh, Summer Bowman, my former uh, co-fellow at Emory when I was there, she was surge path when I was um, soft tissue, and then she went to soft tissue at Cleveland Clinic. Um, in any case, uh, really great examples of angiomatoid FH that didn't have good blood filled spaces, that didn't have good lymphoid cuff. I've seen some that have real whirling, swirling, almost perineurioma like areas, weird ones that would make you not think of it. So it's good to read that and recognize there's definitely a spectrum of changes. So yeah, if in doubt, that's a great tumor. When you think you got a fibrohistiocytic looking thing and you see some spaces or some lymphs and plasma cells, always think, oh, could it be angiomatoid FH? Because um, they're rare and they're easy to miss and they can sometimes have a you know, kind of intermediate malignant uh, behavior can metastasize the nodes and stuff. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. More of those giant cells. Oh, I can't get enough of that. So good.